All right, here we are. So welcome everyone to What a Word is Worth, a space for creative minds to speak about viable ways to heal the world through writing and other inventive mediums. This is your host, Marianela Medrano. I am the founder of Palabra Training Center where words are giving us medicine. We are dedicated to creating a more compassionate and just world by training those who are invested and committed to making change possible. We welcome people from all walks of life, financial means and physical challenges to join us. If you would like to learn more or feel inspired to become a supported, please visit palabracenter.org. And um, today my guest is Dr. David Kopas. Uh, he's actually back here for a second time. I interviewed him with another um, two colleague, colleagues last year. And I am delighted to have him back. He is a psychiatrist at the Seattle Veterans Affairs Primary Care Clinic. And he's, in educa he's an education champion with the National VA Office of Patient-Centered Care and Cultural Transformation. So my goodness, so wonderful to know that that exists. Um, there he teaches whole health to VA staff across the USA. He is also board certified in psychiatry and holistic and integrative medicine and is an assistant professor at the University of Washington. He has always been interested in whole person holistic treatments and delivery systems and has traveled um, to different parts of the world in the pursuit of knowledge and the offering of services. I know for certain he worked for three years in New, Ze in New Zealand, tending to indigenous population. David is uh, also board certified through the American Board of Psychiatric and Neurology, as well as the American Board of Integrative and Holistic Medicine and the American Board of Integrative Medicine. And he is the author of Re- Humanizing Medicine, a Holistic Framework for Transforming Yourself, and that's self with capital S, your practice and the culture of medicine and walking the medicine wheel, healing trauma and PTSD, becoming medicine, pathways of initiation into a living spirituality, and becoming who we are, beautiful painted arrows lessons for children age ages 10 to 1000 or 100. Which one is it? Oh, 100. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, awesome 100. if you can get there. Uh -huh. I, I think I, I, I put a, an extra zero there. I, I have an issue with math. Mm. <laughs> um, so those, uh, those, um, the, the, three last books that I cited, he has co-authored with Joseph Rael, who is a beautiful painted arrow. So thank you so much, um, David, for being back here. Welcome, and I'm so glad that there is a, another spirit there with you. Oh, yes, you see my our dog, Corbin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he usually sits in his workstation, uh, a little yeah. padded place he has here, but he was just yeah. looking around. Yeah, so that's one of the, the uh, you know, kind of working from home now so much, you get to be around your, your pets and. Yes, and do more. life. Yes, yes, <laughs> right. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me back. Yeah, no, thank you for being here. I know you have a busy schedule. Um, talk to us about the process of co-creating healing with Joseph Ryle. Um, what makes, what has made this partnership so vital? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, um, we started back in 2014 and I mm -hmm. was doing um, a hero's journey class for veterans. Mm -hmm. And 
I just happened, I'd read some of Joseph Rael's books and yeah. um, I was reading a book by Kurt Wilt who'd written kind of a biography of Joseph and he compared Joseph's life to like a real life hero's journey. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And so I just emailed him and Kurt said, well, I think Joseph would be interested in what you're doing. And so Joseph, I emailed Joseph and he said, well, why don't you come down and visit? I said, well, I'm in Seattle. He said, well, I'm you know, on the Southern Ute Reservation. And I said, well, how long should I come down for? He said, three days ought to do it. So, you know, I came down. I thought I'd just write a chapter, you know, interview him. I was tape recording him at the time, uh -huh. interview him for a chapter on indigenous approaches to healing. Uh, from and including narrative and the hero's mm -hmm. journey kind of perspective. Mm -hmm. But the first night when I wrote up my notes, um, Joseph, well, I, I was writing up my notes and I was just was like, there's like a whole book here just from talking to him for one day. There's like a whole book. And so the next day I said, you know, I thought I'd write a chapter, but it almost seems like there's a whole book here. And he just nonchalantly said, yeah, that's what I was thinking. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So, but it's really grown. I mean, and the, relationship in a way my learning to work with him is really kind of like an initiation or apprenticeship uh, of sorts mm -hmm. in that I have to kind of learn how to listen to him to what he's saying to understand the cultural perspectives he's coming from and then to write it down as quickly as possible you know usually I just do handwritten notes now whenever we talk and I've got a little notebook I'm actually using that notebook now you know um, where whenever we talk I just kind of jot things down because I never know when we're just kind of hanging out and talking and when he's kind of teaching and so so I decide he's always kind of teaching so I always have a pen and paper handy and um, but then I have to figure out sometimes because this conversations, you know, we can talk for hours sometimes. And then how do you decide what to kind of um, bring down into writing into a kind of condensed form? So I'm always trying to be true to his teaching, but I can't do word for word. And also to the way he teaches, it's different reading a book where you kind of expect a linear argument or a linear um, development of thought. Whereas when he's teaching, it's very circular. So I might hear a story that I don't think really means much of anything, but three days later when I'm with him, he might say the same story and all of a sudden it makes sense. I'm like, okay, well, how do I fit this kind of multidimensional um, circular narrative together? So I, I always look at it as kind of a, it's a practice for me where I'm always trying to learn how to do this. Um, and then I give him the materials to look at and he, he kind of skims them over. He's, he doesn't take a linear approach of a line editor where he looks at like every single word. He's kind of like feeling more the gestalt of it or the, the energy mm -hmm. of it. And so I'll sometimes add something or take something out, but it's usually pretty minor. So I always feel a lot of responsibility to try and get it right, you know? You know, as I hear you, I'm thinking um, for me, coming from a culture, a circular, you know, culture as well, even though it's being beaten up and, and we have lost a lot along the way. But I, I remember um, coming to this country and kind of struggling. And I think I even say it, said it to you today that I, we talk, we go around the bush a lot when we talk. And at the beginning, when I first started interacting with the American way of doing things, I thought that it was a problem until I, I actually started doing my dissertation on the Taino people of the Dominican Republic. And I realized that that's the way <laughs> like we go in circle until we get to the heart of things. So um, I'm so glad that you have recognized that in Joseph and that you are using that to, to um, as, a, as a way of learning yourself, if I, if I heard you correctly, that, that you're seeing that there is a validity to that. Yes, yes. And um, so, you know, like the first time I met him, Mm -hmm. those three days he had me we met at a hotel and then mm -hmm. he had me drive around in the country to different places and we'd pull off and we'd look at a field a hill with an empty field and we'd sit there and there'd be trucks you know kind of whizzing by on this kind of busy highway and we're sitting there and he would 
you know, spend 45 minutes, maybe an hour, you know, just talking, then we get out and walk around and then we drive to another place. But this was another thing that took me a while to understand that at one point I thought, why aren't we just sitting with a cup of coffee? And why isn't he just telling me all these stories like in the hotel lobby or something? But the relationship to the land was very important to him. So I realized literally he was having me walk in his footsteps. So he took me to the place where he had his first vision. Then he took me to a place where he had another vision. And, and so, you know, now when I think about him and his life, and even when I'm writing, sometimes I can imagine, you know, the, the land where, where he was living um, at different times in his life. And so that was another perspective, I think, of not just linear, but um, sometimes they'll say that, that Westerners have a portable identity. Mm-hmm. Our identity isn't like rooted into a particular place where his mm-hmm. identity is really rooted into a particular place. And, you know, he grew up on tribal um, uh, reservation land. So, you know, there's a historic, uh, historical um, relationship that his people have to those specific plots of land. And the stories often relate to different places on the land. Um, So that's also been a learning experience for me and to a challenge like for how I even relate to my backyard. So one of the things I've been working on lately myself is just to recognize nature everywhere, not just nature out on the ocean or in a mountain or forest or somewhere, but, you know, nature on my front sidewalk, um, nature in my backyard. And to um, approach every place with a sense of kind of relationship and respect and wonder uh, for all the life that's everywhere, not just out in the parks. Yes. And, and, you know, I, I will add to that, and I don't know if you agree with me, that also we are part of nature. So um, also approaching the body, Mm -hmm. right, from that... um, sense of both uh, respect and curiosity. Uh, So in that way, going into, and I actually have been um, experimenting with that as I uh, shelter in place with the pandemic, I go into the the backyard, which is not, you know, too big. And I, I try to to see how the body feels. Sometimes I touch the ground. Now, probably I won't do it because it's, it's becoming to freeze um, with, the, with the winter, but um, that, that body is also part of that. Um, but let me- um, Can I say one it, more thing before you ask a yeah, question yeah. on that? Because it, it sparked something for me. So mm-hmm. with our body, um, in a way we're each a national park. You know, that. our bodies are each <laughs> this national park that deserves to be cared for and maintained. And, mm-hmm. and the health of our park affects the health of all the parks around us as well. And it's one of the things that Joseph, uh, one of the things he wanted to teach to, to children is you're already born divine. And in growing up, you lose sight of your divinity. And so one of the things he wants to teach is, you know, becoming who you are is really remembering that you were already born divine. You're already born a shaman. And so um, the, there's a, the learning process that we go through, kind of the linear learning process of school and education and life. But the spiritual learning process is more of a circular learning process and a looping back to who we were when we started. Ah, and that's the perennial wisdom, right? That, that, that travels throughout traditions. Mm. Yeah, but I, I, I love that the body as a natural park. Mm. I probably, I was telling you that I quote you and Joseph a lot. So that's another quote that I will use for my embodied writing. <laughs> I might my... use that one <laughs> <laughs> too. <laughs> um, so in becoming medicine, you talk mm. about pathways of initiation into a living spirituality as a possibility. The initiation you are talking about is the soul journey, but some think we have lost our way. I have heard Gregory Cajete point to that. Mm -hmm. And just today, I read a newsletter from American clinical psychologist, Bill Pluckin, who is suggesting that one reason 
the journey of this of soul initiation has been lost for so long is because it has become nearly impossible for people in egocentric societies to even understand what it is. And he says, once forgotten for a few generations, it is hard to later identify as having ever existed, but there are other deeper reasons, he says. So do you agree with plucking and that the journey of soul initiation has been lost? And how do we go back to it? Yeah, this is a good question. I've thought about this a lot from different perspectives. Um, so in learning from Joseph, he's got a living heritage tradition of spirituality that's rooted in a place and, um, you know, the Pueblo people, uh, the Utes got moved around some, but they have some of their traditional lands, but the Pueblo people, they really were able to stay on their traditional lands. They lost, it got shrunk down a lot, but, um, you know, the people of Picaris Pueblo, where he grew up, they're in the same place they've been for, you know, hundreds, thousands of years. And then, you know, I thought about myself and, and there's a couple different ways. You know, I always worry about cultural appropriation. So I'm trying to learn from Joseph, but I'm trying to back translate it for myself into my own culture. And, and for myself, I think, well, when did my ancestors have a living connection to the land? Um, you know, of the Celts and in, in the Welsh or the Slavic peoples in, in Poland. And I'm thinking back, you know, thousands of years to that. Um, and how sad it is when you lose this living connection to spirituality or connection to living spirituality. And yet in working with Joseph, I've learned that everything is there in ourselves and in the world trying to teach us. So for instance, um, the word for grass is, is um, chle or, or ma chle is, is number, number six and then chle is grass um, and, and chle means ancient. So when you walk across the grass, if you're paying attention and listening, ancient wisdom is actually being activated as you're walking across the grass. And so I thought, well, where, where did the ancient people discover wisdom when it wasn't ancient? Or maybe they were discovering wisdom that was already ancient. They learned it by um, becoming who they are and by listening to the world around them and re you know, relating in a deep way. So in a sense, every generation, particularly in the West, every generation has to kind of like rediscover itself and kind of reconnect to this because um, we don't have as much of the tradition of initiation where it's passed on from generation to generation. Yeah, so the key is in um, going back to the source, right? And that's the, so when, um, I, 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 I really agree with that and, and, and that, that idea that ancient wisdom gets activated through uh, living spirituality, basically, is what I'm... So for the listeners who might not be too familiar with what a living spirituality is, can you say more about that? And I, I, I so much appreciate what you, the distinction that you're making. Um, in terms of what that might mean for different cultures mm -hmm. and, and what you're saying, you know, the, the idea of uh, avoiding uh, cultural appropriation as much as we can. Um, but let's, let's say mm -hmm. in America, um, how do we describe living spirituality? Mm -hmm. So I think it's a relationship you know, having a relationship and mm -hmm. being in a state, you know, Joseph will talk about being, uh, you know, a shaman or a mystic or a visionary. In a way, it's entering into a visionary state or entering into a mystic state of becoming capable of living life and experiencing life rather than, you know, to use some psychological language, we could say rather than being bounded within our ego um, and relating to the world through our ego, of being able to relate to the world through ourself, um, you know, our larger total being, 
um, not just our kind of mind and consciousness and logic and rationality. So I think about enlightenment a little bit like, you know, I think I used to think when I'd read about Zen and Buddhism and different things, and I was always like, oh, I want to achieve enlightenment. And this sounds so cool. And I thought it'd be this thing that somehow you, you got to that was a, a different state of being that was somewhere else almost, you know? Mm -hmm. And I've come to look at this. I don't claim to be enlightened at, at all, um, but I've come to look at like the glimpses of enlightenment are these times when there's sort of timeless, eternal moments that you get in the present where you feel the boundary between yourself and the world or the boundary between yourself and others really kind of breaks down and everything is just as it is, you know, kind of like a being present or being mindful in a way. So I've come to think about, you know, maybe the difference between somebody who's, who's quote enlightened and somebody who's not, is they're able to stay in a state of being present with reality. Um, so it's not about going somewhere else. It's more about being here fully. Yeah. And then from a, from Joseph's perspective, reality has a ordinary reality element and then periodically non-ordinary reality breaks through. Um, and non-ordinary reality is the stratum um, or the base of where reality comes from. So from his perspective, I think he's also trying to make himself as open as possible to dreams and visions um, and non-ordinary reality, because then that illuminates reality in a different way. You know, just like with the grass, if you just think, oh, I've got to go mow the grass and I'm walking across the grass. And there's a suburban mentality of everyone wants to have a lot of grass for some reason. And Joseph's like, you know, all those people spending all those hours on the grass, they're really trying to get ancient wisdom, but they just don't know what they're doing. <laughs> Absolutely love the, you know, and I'm I'm reminded um, I I um, spend my time thinking a lot. Um, you know, I'm not an ordained Buddhist, but I do live um, my life uh, following you know as much as I can on Buddha's full step, uh, footsteps, and I also pay a great deal of attention to, as I say, to my own people, uh, the Tainos and, and our traditions. And I think um, what you just said makes so much sense and also brings me back to the work of Senju Earthling Manuel. She, she wrote a book, The Ways of Tenderness, and she talks about, um, you know, she describes the body as spirit and spirit as body. So that um, forever uh, fluid connection um, between us and, and, and spirit and the body, uh, they're inseparable. And for what you were saying, um, I think that that is the notion, right, that can keep us in the here now moment or presence that can then connect us to ancient wisdom, but we need this body, we need this, this self um, at the growth and at, at the um, at the spiritual um, levels. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It reminds me, um, mm -hmm. you know, Joseph talks about the two ordinary reality and mm -hmm. non-ordinary reality. Mm -hmm. And then when you're talking about the body and the spirit, mm -hmm. um, Henry Corbin, our dog is named after Henry Corbin, the, the <laughs> philosopher. So not, not Corbin, our dog, he'll think we're talking about him. But Henry Corbin, the author, um, wrote about esoteric Islam and had this term called the Alam al-Mathal. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, you know, but yeah. um, Alam al-Mathal. And it, it was this spiritual place, a place in the imagination, not in the imagination of fantasy, but the imagination mm -hmm. of reality, the reality mm -hmm. imagination, almost like the mm -hmm. platonic archetypes, I think mm -hmm. sometimes. But there was this third realm. There's a place where um, spirits are materialized and matter is spiritualized. So instead of having the two things in a dualism, there was actually kind of like a, a triism, I guess, of there was a place where, where they were kind of in between a liminal space where, where matter is getting spiritualized and spirits getting materialized. And so that breaks down this inseparable 
um, kind of division between the things of matter and the things of spirit. That makes so much sense. And, you know, you referred um, in, in, I think it's in Becoming, in one of the books, you, you talk about uh, the three visionaries that you have encountered, Carl Jung, Henry Corbin, and Joseph Ryle. And what I'm thinking is, um, in thinking about, you know, those who want to become visionaries, um, but who are living amid the chaos of day-to-day -day America. Um, let's say, you know, working at a hospital or sitting on long board meetings. <laughs> Is it possible to remain a visionary or to become one while grappling with the day-to-day -day then? Is that, are we saying that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think so because um, I think Joseph would say we were already born visionaries and we just forgot how to do it. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. it's really a matter of paying attention that everything is already there. Yeah. Um, and so it's really a matter of paying attention or like in, in psychotherapy, um, you know, Reich's listening with the third ear. You know, we're, we're in this mm -hmm. time, we're listening to all these different things that the, the client's telling us. And yet we're listening in a different way that takes is kind of like a mindfulness. It's a training, it's a skill, it's a practice to be able to listen to kind of what's not there, the things that connect everything else, um, the, the structures of a person's life that aren't there on the surface, but then after, after you do that for so long and go through school and practice it, you just do it automatically and you can't help but do it sometimes. You, you're not even trying and you're doing it. And so I think the same thing, it's a skill to see non-ordinary reality or be in touch with non-ordinary reality or to be a visionary. It's a skill that you can develop through a practice just like anything else, but it's a practice of, you know, if you think of kids, kids are, are wildly imaginative and they're mm -hmm playing all sorts of games and they could stare for, you know, an hour, lie down on the grass in the grass and watch, you know, insects for an hour. That's the type of concentration that you'd need to have to be a visionary. And then, um, or like your dreams, I've had times where I've tried to analyze my dreams more. And I found the more I went to bed thinking about my dreams and I wrote down my dreams as soon as I woke up, I realized I was starting to remember my dreams more and it seemed like I was actually dreaming more, but I think it was more, I was just attending to something that was always there that I just was too busy to, to um, register. Yeah. And I think you, you refer, you call that in your book, uh, the imaginal function. One of you <laughs> referred to it as the imaginal function, mm -hmm. right? That, mm -hmm. that we, we get, um, detached from it by conditioning mm -hmm. but we are one I, I guess one one skin um layer away from it mm -hmm. <laughs> um so in i think this is a good segue into the the idea of um separation and collective trauma and you know the possibility of growth after, after trauma. So I see the way I see becoming medicine, especially, I think it's, it's, it's such a gift for the world. Um, I see becoming medicine almost like a blueprint for, for post-trauma growth um, as it leans on the power of relationships and the web of interdependence um, as the glue that keep holding the world together. Mm. And in becoming medicine, you remind us that we are medicine, that we are the medicine back, we need to heal ourselves. So how do we use our medicine bag to change the ill narrative, the um, pathogenic narrative that some of us 
are taught through social conditioning. How do we, what are some ways that we can tap into that um, medicine, inner medicine, uh, that notion that we are uh, the medicine bag that we need mm -hmm. to carry always? Yeah. Well, thank you for that question. I was feeling the same thing of like that we'd kind of gone off on this esoteric thing talking about yeah. visionaries and mysticism yeah. and all this stuff and then I, I was thinking just as you were saying well let's shift I was thinking but this isn't esoteric it's about no. healing yeah. you know and that's the yeah. reason you go there that yeah. you know we know with mindfulness you go into a mindfulness state it has all sorts of physiological health functions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it would be the same thing if we studied visionary states. And there's some people who've talked about um, even like trance states uh, and dissociative mm -hmm. states and ceremony, that those may have some form of, um, of a healing property, a physiological healing property. And so the, the medicine bag, Joseph, um, something that he had written somewhere, I think, um, about... Um, the heart is the medicine bag and it's filled with sacred objects. So again, in thinking of ourselves as a national park or international park or a cosmic, um, you know, reserve, cosmic park, a cosmic <laughs> park um, we have within ourselves this emptiness and, and uh, you know, Joseph's traditions, they would go into the Kiva and would go into darkness to see the light, you know, to become enlightened or to, to do spiritual practices. Whereas, you know, in, in Western traditions, there is that um, tradition of, of, you know, finding the light in the darkness, but there's very much a, a rejection of darkness and, you know, trying to always go into the light. Um, and Jung, you know, talked about we don't become enlightened by imagining the light, we become enlightened by, you know, working through our shadow. Um, so let's see, let's find this back, the thread again. So um, we already have within us that which we need. And so it's a more a matter of activating it. Oh, and, and I was going to just say the interplay between the emptiness and darkness of the heart. Like I talk about the, um, the uh, Sanskrit term uh, guha, um, mm -hmm. which is uh, the cave of the heart. And so I was really, really fascinated with this idea of the heart being this place of transformation, but also mm -hmm. this place of being empty. And if you think about the physiological heart, how the heart works, it's four different caves. You know, we've got the atrium and the ventri the atria and the ventricles, and it works by emptying completely and then filling and emptying mm -hmm. and filling and emptying and filling. And so I started to think about, you know, maybe the spiritual path is going into the emptiness until the fullness comes in. But if you don't accept the emptiness, you're never going to get that fullness. And so these two are almost like a yin yang. And, and like with the heart itself, I started thinking, well, if the heart just thought I want to be full, well, that's congestive heart failure. You know, you got too much blood there and it can't, you know, and it's, and the heart gets bigger and bigger and that's not actually a healthy heart. And if the heart's too empty, you know, well then, you know, you're going to have low blood pressure and like, you're not going to get oxygen to the tissues. And, and so, so the heart is actually from Joseph talking about that medicine bag, I started to think about doing these heart meditations, even for health professionals, where we think about um, kind of burnout and, and, you know, the heart um, receives the, the blood, the heart receives is depleted. Uh, the, the blood is deoxygenated, you know, so it's quote, worst blood in the body and the heart accepts it and doesn't like complain and say, oh, I always get the bad blood, you know, why me? Or it doesn't try to push it away. It accepts whatever comes to it. And in accepting the um, bad blood, we could call it, or the depleted blood, then the heart works with its, its uh, buddy, the lungs, and the heart receives the richest blood in the body, the most oxygenated blood in the body. And so it's an organ that accepts kind of the, the worst and the best, and it helps transform the worst into the best. So again, with healing, I think that this, we have this physiological, you know, mass of muscle within us. That's also a metaphor for transformation of taking the things that are depleted and um, lacking in vitality and rejuvenating them. And when the heart receives that best blood of the body, it also doesn't say, oh, goody, 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 I'm going to keep it all for me. You know, it gives it away. Mm -hmm. So 
the transformation actually works from trying to be in the balance of, you know, if we expand this out into life, the suffering and the joy of life. That if you want to be joyful in life, you have to be um, uh, capable of experiencing great suffering because they kind of flow through the same tube. I, I would tell patients that, you know, in the past, yeah. like you can cut off your emotions if you want. Mm. Good news, you can cut off your emotions. Bad news is that your positive and negative emotions flow through the same tube. Yeah. So you cut off the sadness, you cut off the joy too. Exactly. So, you know. Yeah, I mean, there are so many, um, so much richness in what you're saying that I'm having, my heart is actually pounding here because there are so many angles that I want to tackle here. I mean, what I'm hearing is the important, the centrality of the heart, the centrality of language to how we, you know, language in things um, is a form of freedom, is a form of, of healing. And, you know, one of the things that perhaps what I'll do, because it's seriously it's so much in what you um, I, every time I talk to you, I feel like, okay, we need three days. <laughs> That's how it was with Joseph, three days. The three days usually does it. <laughs> oh, so let's go into the concept of verb people, verb uh, people, um, and how language heals. Um, and, and what I'm going with these, most of the ancient wisdom was orally transmitted. I mean, I come from an oral tradition. There was no the written word, didn't exist. So the heart, um, which is where most the memory is located, as is the body, right? The body is the, the, um, the, the, the container of, of most of our memories. Um, most of our traditions were passed through oral language. So I think in the book, you, 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 you refer to oral traditions as the verb people, the action people through the verb, right? language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Um, mm -hmm. So, and, you know, after all, this podcast is rooted in the idea that words mm -hmm. are medicine and that in each word, there is the seed of healing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to go back to what, what you were saying, we are not naive, though. We, we don't think that we also know that words in their negative side or when they are restricted, they also contain the seed of illness and destruction. Right. Mm -hmm. So we have that with language. I don't know where we can go with them. Maybe just just. Um, Talk a little bit more about this idea yeah. of uh, verb people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a few things with this. So um, this was something early on Joseph told me that um, mm -hmm. English and Spanish and most Western languages are noun languages. They're very heavy in nouns, whereas indigenous languages are, are tend to be more verb um, focused. And at first you think, well, big deal, noun or verb, whatever, they're both parts of sentences. And so it's just maybe kind of a different emphasis, but the a difference is um, in a noun language, nouns are, are a person, place or thing. They're based, the way you define a person, place or thing is by separating it from other person, people, places and things. The name. So there's this act of objectivity and, mm -hmm. and, and, and nouning, you know, I suppose Joseph <laughs> would, would call it if you put a noun, the act of, of making things nouns into a verb. Nouning is an act of separating. And one of the things that we come to in becoming medicine is healing is a very simple thing. All you do is you stop separating things on whatever level the separation is occurring you're, whether it's you know you viewing yourself as a separate you're viewing your body as separate from your mind or your spirit um, you viewing yourself as separate from nature um, and then in the verb language though it enters into a relationship with with um, things so so I think I give an example somewhere uh, David and Joseph talk on the phone versus Daviding and Josephing talking 
phoning, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. So it's this, it, yeah. it, it's this yeah. thing yeah. that's both um, kind of universal because anybody can do talking, anybody mm-hmm. can do phoning. There's mm-hmm. also the Daviding that's going on, which is, mm-hmm. you know, all yeah. of who, who I am and who I'm bringing into the present yeah. and the Josephing that's going on. And so looking at things from a verb language is more of like an interconnected web mm-hmm. of being mm-hmm. versus mm-hmm. Um, isolated points on that web, yeah. isolated nodes on the web. And they could be, we have both in sentences and they could mm-hmm. be you know, almost like a figure in ground where you, mm-hmm. you know, you focus on one or you focus on the other, or you experience kind of both together and they create kind of a, a net of a being, you know, I think of like um, Indra's net, which um, was this concept of all these nodes, interconnected nodes, and each node is like a, a gem or a mirror that reflects all the other nodes. So the way that you see the whole is you look at the individual. When you look at the individual, you see in that individual reflected the entire whole because they're all a mirrored uh, network. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a sympathetic <laughs> resonance that, that, that happens. Yeah. You know, can I, we're almost at the end here and I, I, wanna, I want to piggyback again on the idea of separation. Um, and and I want to I want to play with the with opposites here. So there is separation as that violent act that that interrupts our wholeness. You know the myth of separation that we are separate separate entities when in reality we are always whole and part interconnected. And then there is the separation as necessary for initiation. So can you, can you um, say more about this duality? Um, mm-hmm. That is not actually, in the end, it's not duality. But mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Do you see what I'm being? Yes, yes, mm-hmm. yes. So the image I got, you know, when you were talking there about the, the separation and like the violent act, but I was mm-hmm. also thinking of the, the creative act um, of like the Big Bang, we take the, mm-hmm. the story mm-hmm. of the Big Bang, and we have a singularity where everything is one, mm-hmm. and then, you know, it sort of bangs out into all these different things that we become. The, you know, create stars, and then those stars go through their lifetime, and they die, and they go supernova, and they create heavier and heavier elements. And so, you know, the idea that we're all created of like, you know, the the kind of the um, the death of of the first stars of the the universe but i got an image if we looked at that from the inside you know we're looking at it from the outside of of one goes out into the many but if we looked at all of creation as happening within that singularity and it, maybe it's it's all instead of we look at it it going out and, and forming into the world there's a way of looking at it as all in occurring within a single point like that vase that that you have that that mm-hmm. i think i don't know if he drew it or mm-hmm. you did. yeah, yeah. Where god and humans meet yes yeah yeah right that's that's what you're talking about right 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 yeah, yeah. There is right exactly there. Yeah. exactly yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. yes oh thank you Beautiful. for that yep. yeah putting it into something that's sitting right over my desk yeah. yes <laughs> so so it's like it within this this vase um, yeah. is all the space coming out from a single point there that comes into the two people. And then, yeah. you know, so, so it, it's the apparent um, multiplicity that mm-hmm. is still a, a singularity. Mm-hmm. And then, so initiation in a sense, when you asked about how is that different at first, I thought, well, maybe if we could stay true to who we were born as Mm -hmm. we wouldn't need to be initiated we don't have to separate then (laughs) yeah but even in traditional societies you know where where there isn't you know there wasn't all the the separation these initiations still took place because people grow and develop over time and so you know i suppose a you know an infant is different than a child is different than a, a young adult is different than a yeah. mature adult the and, evolutionary nature yeah, of yeah. things yeah which is fluid right, right. It doesn't, it's it's beautiful mm-hmm. because there is this fluidity that has a connected that's an umbilical cord mm-hmm. that never gets cut i mm-hmm. guess is a way to put it that the umbilical cord from um 
Mother Earth, our essence, never gets caught. Right. We right. forget, though. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> so, but even in those traditional societies where you'd think there wasn't as much sort of forgetting of, of our mm -hmm. sacredness, they still had initiation elements. And maybe that's just part of how we learn. I mean, if we think about the Big Bang, the way the universe came into, mm -hmm. um, you know, existence through the, the science story of the Big Bang, mm -hmm. we were one and then we separated. And then, um, you know, at some point things, evolution happens from things kind of coming together and falling apart. And so separation in the form of initiation is just a step. And I suppose this even, you know, if we're going to walk from here to there, we have to separate from where we are here and go mm -hmm. over there. Mm -hmm. Although Joseph would say the training for a shaman is that you can be in both places at the same time. You don't even have yes. to, you know, right. have to go over right. there. So that's the non-ordinary way or the esoteric way as a shaman mm -hmm. can be in two places at once. Mm -hmm. But in our bodies, you know, our foot separates from the ground and, and then mm -hmm. reconnects with the ground. Mm -hmm. um, so another way of thinking about this, I suppose, would be that, and, and even the breath, you know, um, and the heartbeat, you know, the, the heart fills with blood and it empties of blood. The breath mm -hmm. comes into the body mm -hmm. and it empties. So, you so know. that is a form of, of separation. Of separation. Yeah, That's, Michael. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. I'm like just sort of trying to puzzle it out. It's a really good question yeah. that I hadn't thought about in the way you asked before, but mm -hmm. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts? Um, yeah, no, no. I think you're, you're, on? I like what, what you're saying. And what I was thinking, the image I had, um, as you were speaking right now, is what we do when we do walking meditation, that we're constantly, um, being cognizant um, or aware of the body, but also um, of how the body touches earth. So that's how the um, consciousness of the here and now it, it's, is embodied. Um, so the, the body is constantly being in the air and, and on the ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So many of the stories, the creation stories um, across the world often talk about the one thing that you must not forget. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet in all the stories, the human beings forget the one thing you, you know, do, you can do anything you want. Don't look in this box or do anything you want. Don't eat this apple <laughs> or do anything you want, you know, just always do this. Um, and so as human beings, we are beings of forgetfulness. Mm -hmm. And I suppose another way of looking at initiation is it's a ceremony of remembering, remembering. for beings of forgetfulness. Yes. And, Yes, which is, yeah. you know, that's the seed of mindfulness, actually. Mindfulness is remembering our wholeness, remembering where we come from. Um, so when I do the, the, the trainings on um, mindful writing, I talk about, you, you know, bringing the body parts, literally all the members of the body back in, into wholeness. Um, so in one last question about, um, you know, the hope that we both see, how do, you know, you are out there working at the VA, working at the national level, in your view, for the healing power of writing to set camp in the mental health of um, settings of America? Are we very close to having, you know, the grounds to set camp? Or do you think we, it's a long way? For I think as beings of forgetfulness, you know, it can be demoralizing if we think we're beings of forgetfulness who think of mm -hmm. ourselves as separate and um, want to get everything we can for ourselves, which actually creates suffering. And we want to hold on to the good and keep out the bad and all that. Um, yet we're also beings of remembering and beings of, of hope as well as beings of despair. And so, you know, right now, when you're asking me this, my answer is um, we're always far away from it, but we're always close to it as well. And it sort of depends on which, which way you 
which way you look like there's a um, you know, parable that comes I don't know which tradition it comes out of it's a Native American story but I apologize I don't know what um, kind of tribe or culture it comes out of but of feeding the two wolves you know there's kind of you know the the wolf of selfishness and the wolf of of you know of um service or the wolf of separation and the wolf of wholeness and connection and so the the elder is telling the the, the child about these two wolves and then the child says well well which wolf wins and the elder says well whichever one we feed so every day we've yeah. got this choice you know do which which aspect of our nature do we feed you know do we mm -hmm. feed the separation of, mm -hmm. of ourselves or do we feed mm -hmm. the wholeness of ourselves do we feed the fragmentation or do we yeah. feed the wholeness yeah. um and so in becoming medicine i think i wrote at one point from from talking with joseph about every moment is an epiphany mm -hmm. you yes. know every moment yes, is a potential epiphany every moment is divine and it's sacred mm -hmm. however in every moment we have to remember to open up to mm -hmm. um, experience that possibility Mm -hmm. um, so, so then going back to my question of is there a place mm -hmm. for the healing power of writing mm -hmm. in um let, let's call it mainstream mm -hmm. mental health in america do you think yeah. we have a chance <laughs> i mean definitely. you are doing yeah. it right mm -hmm. yeah yeah definitely you know at the va there's something we call my life my story mm -hmm. which is a project of getting a veteran's life story in their own words into the chart into the electronic medical record so so we're putting the veterans own words and story into the chart and you know i've been interested sorry you keep asking me about words and i keep not answering uh, with words but not talking about words i also started this this kind of thing on my my blog being fully human of words create worlds and I had this whole series it was rabbi rabbi heschel who said words create worlds and he was talking about the world of Nazism, you know, of how these, right. these mm -hmm. negative words created uh, the Nazi regime and created the death camps and all these things. And, and he says the death camps didn't start with death camps, they started with ideas and words. And those words gradually led to here. And so over the last presidential administration, I was very, very worried about, you know, all these words, I saw these words, and the words I knew people would say, Oh, you know, they don't mean anything or that's just how he talks or you know he, he's it, yeah it sounds like fascism but it's not really fascism and i was like you know if the words sound like fascism and you, you keep yeah, saying yeah. them pretty soon you're gonna have an insurrection <laughs> you know um you're gonna have yeah. violence um yeah. if you're valuing words of violent separation and mm -hmm. and um you know i mean that's all those words are is like mm -hmm. yeah, this is mine you people mm -hmm. are bad we're mm -hmm. good people. This mm -hmm. is mine. Um, all that is words of separation. And so, you know, I started to try and counter that with words of connection. And so mm -hmm. if words create mm -hmm. worlds. Again, we have the choice in every moment. What kind of words are we going to write down? And so changing the narrative in, in a therapy setting, you know, um, I work with some uh, Native veterans and trying mm -hmm. to change the narrative from being a broken person to coming from a broken lineage. Exactly. And so if you can change that story, the words of that story to instead of I'm broken, mm -hmm. to say, I came from a broken tradition, and I can, mm -hmm. you know, if you're broken, it's hard to fix yourself. If, mm -hmm. if you come from if there's something outside that's broken, well, you can mm -hmm. kind of start tinkering around and try and fix it. Yeah. Thank you for being that person out there. And you know you have to come back, though. No, I will. I will. It's always so nice talking <laughs> with you. We are right not now. done here mm. in, by any stretch of the imagination. So mm -hmm. you have to come back. But for today, we have to say goodbye. So thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you. Um, I'll find another excuse soon to, to bring you back. Anytime. <laughs> so thank you all for listening to what a word is worth. You can access today's interview at Anchor, and um, I'll also post it on my channel, my YouTube channel. And if you are interested, hit the subscribe button in your podcast app. And also, if you found our program beneficial, leave a review. And um, I am with you in love and compassion always.
Thank you.